and we are live. Welcome to the Pocket Now Weekly. This week, Apple again seems to be blocking third party repairs with software updates bricking phones. A Xiaomi might be looking to acquire GoPro. Snap is bringing a second generation of spectacles to the market. And are Android manufacturers lying about security patches and updates? We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 300 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Uh, recorded April 13th at noon Pacific. Happy Friday the 13th. This <laughs> weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid. And, you know, high-tech, battery-powered face computers would definitely not have been creepy. But we're going to talk about them today because it's Friday the 13th like they're totally creepy. I'm Juan Carlos Spagnell, contributing editor at pocketnow.com joined as always by plucky podcast producer mr jules wong on the east coast it's a scary day out there i hope you're doing well i hope so too and you may have noticed if you're watching the live stream on this that we are joined by a third window this week i was gonna do my man the myth the legend thing but he wanted you. me to come Thank up you. with something else so just regular normal random dude uh, Hi, Mater Yvetta from the Pocket Now Daily is joining us to talk about the week's top tech stories. Hello, hello. With a couple of additions, uh, can you believe that this guy needs to wear prescription glasses? Now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even the Mona Lisa is falling apart, bud. Even the I, Mona know. Lisa. I know, I know. We're aging gracefully. So I, I used to have a boss many years right. ago who told me uh, he's a pilot and he's like, well, dude, I mean, I, your eyes literally have a warranty. It is standard warranty up until you're 40. So I'm not yeah. 40 yet. I'm still a little far off, but uh, here we go. <laughs> no, I definitely feel that. And especially like from uh, some, some of the recent like side projects and stuff, talking to doctors about ear health and eye health and and uh, technology contributing to some of that too. It's amazing that we can spend our lives staring at the tiny little glowing rectangles that we do and not be wiped out even faster. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, I think you're well joined in this company, good sir, that uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll goes probably to be the resilience of the human body. You know, it's a very, oh, come on, you're what, 21 jewels? <laughs> 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 I'll wait until I'm like 45 and then I'll see and uh, regret my words just now. But hey, until then, yeah. until then, party on, Wayne, party on, Garth. Um, so we've got a we've got a pretty jam packed show to get uh, through, and and uh, we know Jaime, you've you've got a you've got a sort of a schedule that you need to keep to too. Um, I, I want to jump right in. Obviously, if you're watching this live, you can join the conversation in the live chat on our Hangouts YouTube live stream, or you can also uh, help us select uh, good talking points and comments for us to reach throughout the show by heading on over to the Twitters and tweeting at us using the hashtag PN Weekly. Uh, we'll catch that. I'm actually keeping that feed up on my uh, system right now. We already have a few people joining the conversation. I'm seeing Peter Hayton and Andrew Sislak and Fat Produce. So uh, we're sure that they'll be joining the conversation as we go. If you're listening to this after the fact, you can also reach out to us via the old school emails podcast at pocketnow.com, where we collect a lot of that stuff and use it for our listener mailbag episodes at the end of each month. So, uh, Jules, without further ado, man, we've got a lot of news to tackle, man. There were some good stories this week. So uh, good old stories. Right Yes, indeed. For the week of April 9, 2018, this is all the news that is fit to podcast. Some independent repair shops are refuse, uh, refusing to do work on iPhone 8 units. This, as the iOS 11.3 update, has apparently killed touch sensing on third-party display components used to replace the iPhone 8s. A previous iOS update did the same for iPhone 7 replacement screens. There was a fix last time. We'll have to see if one comes along this time. The Korean Fair Trading Commission also against Apple this week, apparently. There's word that the nation's major carriers have complained about carrying the costs of marketing the iPhone for the American giant. This in exchange for standardized materials with limited customization for each carrier. Apple has been issued to please explain. No action has officially been taken just yet. The HomePod is not really doing that well, by the way. After 10 weeks on the market, Apple's smart speaker offering only achieved a 10% share compared to Google's 14% and 73% for Amazon. 7 million units are expected to sell this year of the HomePod, by the way, mm -hmm. to Google Home's 18 million and Amazon Echo's 29 million. 
Redditors have seen test emails for the Spotify Car Player, a 4G connected Alexa powered playback device of some sort that is mounted to a dashboard of a car. It's said to be packaged with Spotify premium service and cost between $13 and $15 per month with a 12 month commitment. Apparently, this may be what we'll see in New York at the event they have announced for April 24. Uh, the LG V35 ThinQ is said to be the next V-series device coming this year from the Korean Chable, with a lot of the same uh, uh, the same uh, components, excuse me, like the 16 megapixel main camera sensor, sensor, and there's also a wide angle camera with a narrow field of view than previous LG smartphones, this one being 107 degrees as opposed to 120 or even 135 degrees. Also, artificial intelligence to heck. The Wall Street Journal reports that Sprint and T-Mobile are again talking about merging. It'd be the third time in four years, though. Details of very scarce at this point. Android manufacturers have been found not to be patching vulnerabilities, even though they say they have been. Security Research Labs reports that on average, ZTE and TCL failed to pass along more than four patches per device over the course of last year. HTC and LG, three or four apiece. Samsung, Sony, and Google, closer to zero on the list. We'll get into a discussion, a deep dive on this in just a few minutes. Chinese tech brand Xiaomi is reported to be considering an acquisition of GoPro. The company, once known for its action cameras, have been uh, has been on the sales block since earlier this year after a heavy decline in business thanks to drone players and even Xiaomi itself with its Yi action cameras. It used to be worth more than $10 billion. Now it might only fetch $1 billion. Meanwhile, Xiaomi is growing its... Uh, business with a rumored IPO soon and uh, worthwhileness in the tens of billions of dollars. Soul singer John Legend has his, uh, had his latest music video for A Good Night featuring Blood, uh, Blood Pop, shot entirely with a Google Pixel 2, and Snapchat, or Snap Inc., has submitted documents for certification. What for? A potential sequel to Spectacles, its first hardware project, Version 002, as they say, and uh, the first uh, project seemed moderately successful for Snapchat. Of course, software-wise, uh, they have been lacking and have failed to uh, keep hold of uh, people, especially after that big uh, marketing faux pas with uh, the ad about Rihanna and uh, domestic abuse uh, headed into that. So uh, just a quick thought. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but... Uh, Snapchat status for you guys. I just love the ambition that these are the 002 spectacles that someday we'll see those like <laughs> 987. <laughs> you went to James Bond. I was thinking like, oh, oh, what happens when we get to the 999th version of spectacles and we have to tick over to the thousandth? Uh, I need a pair. Snapchat I need spectacle. a pair. Yeah, <laughs> just to <laughs> capture with progressive lenses and everything too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in your prescription, like the, the lens attached to the camera has to be in your prescription so that everyone else can see it in uh, their relative uh, prescription view. So that'd be a good idea. I, I, I just, I just don't see where anything that's spectacle related, unless they are somehow jumping into an AR VR world, is really going to capture the public's imagination. Spectacles were a novelty. Um, they were fresh. They were something interesting for the Snapchat platform. And right now it's everything that Snapchat does is being milked by competitors. And I don't think just another fan targeted launch of a specific piece of hardware, which is stuck to one platform is really going to do it for them. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I, I really wanted a pair of spectacles and then I was like, okay, can we come up with another design, please? I mean, yeah. You don't like that side? Really? You didn't want? It's a very enthusiastic plastic. I, I, I actually considered, I was like, okay, this would be a reason for me to actually consider using Snapchat. Uh, but then, you know, I tried them on and I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> I, they, I don't look good with these. So never mind. Uh, I feel that, you know, Snapchat should consider more than one design. Uh, like, I don't know. I, I don't think there was anything wrong with them. I actually considered that to be the you know, a genius way to, to share your stuff, but not 
with those looks. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yep, indeed. Um, let's uh, go up to the top of the rundown here and talk about uh, the iPhone displays. Uh, and uh, this has been an ongoing conversation between multiple owners of uh, these uh, repair shop, in some cases, these repair shop chains, uh, not necessarily related to Apple, nor are they authorized service providers as Apple likes to uh, um, you know, go into contracts with them maximize their profit and whatnot. Uh, and this has been reported by Motherboard. Uh, one shop owner says that they had to um, uh, go through 2,000 reshipments because of the latest uh, display uh, malfunctioning. Apparently, this is uh, going down to a microchip controlling the display and, you know, just not refusing, just refusing to uh, accept the touch. So uh, it's just an ongoing uh, piece in the latest... Uh, saga against third-party shops and uh, apple i wonder exactly what took apple so long because <laughs> uh, we've uh we've known that so here's the thing about apple parts for those of you that don't know every single apple part that you purchase on the on any shop that's not an apple store or a certified uh retailer uh, or a certified repair shop is it's it's a knockoff it's not a real display made by apple it's not a genuine part as much as they tell you it is and i'm saying this mostly for you know my my friends from latin america who you know the, the biggest problem is what happens when you are in a country that does not have a repair store certified by apple which is like i'm in from i'm from honduras and in honduras there is none so a lot of people have been forced to use this display it's not necessarily that they want to use a third-party display they're not even cheaper i mean if you want to replace a display in the apple store it's like 80 bucks if you want to do it on the street, it'll cost you like around 60 to 70. Uh, so, you know, with Apple's extensive control of the hardware, I'm shocked that it took so long for the company to push an update like this. And this is just to prove that, you know, it's just one thing that the company will do. The next thing will be batteries, I guess. I don't know. I mean, well, this, <laughs> this isn't the first time I've seen Apple go after third party hardware, though. Uh, I'm trying to look up and, and I'm sorry, I should have done this before we jumped in live. But there, there were also issues with third party home buttons. Right. Um, yeah. The uh, error 53 right. issue back a couple of yeah. years. And ago, so this, right? this is one of the things because because I agree with you. I'm actually kind of surprised that we've seen Apple sort of slow play into this generation of hardware. There's always something, some part of a repair or some part of a software update, which will which will uh make this a painful experience for third party shops and third party resellers and stuff like that. But, um, and they're I'm, providing I'm, a service that Apple can't, or maybe is not willing to do. Well, but it's, also, it's, it's, it's also, let's say that you are in a first world country with a ton of Apple stores around you. Um, I mean, if we're, if we're sort of acknowledging like a libertarian or, or a conservative argument, shouldn't we have the ability to engage in some kind of competition? And this also kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of the efforts at the state level that we see for right for repair, you mm -hmm. know, for consumers to have the ability to maybe even fix a product on their own and not just take it to a shop or something like that. I remember back in the pocket PC days. I would whip out a soldering iron. I would crack open a case and grind yeah. down a PCB and replace capacitors and stuff like that. Like yeah. these things were expensive and I wanted to keep them running for as long as I possibly could. Um, so, so the thing that I think bothers me about Apple's approach here is that it seems especially punitive to their customers. So, you know, in your example, uh, Jaime, I think is a perfect one. You can't get the right actual Apple service repair affordably and in a time efficient manner for your phone to not be out of commission for weeks. So then you go and you replace the screen and then Apple pushes a software update with no warning to you, which then bricks your phone. Mm -hmm. And that I think overly harms the consumer experience as opposed to I mean, they're already putting a ton of pressure on third party uh, repair shops. But mm -hmm. that's kind of for me, that's where you draw the line in the sand and you say like, there should be some opt out. And I know Apple doesn't like doing this, but if I replace a home button and it's going to brick my phone, there should be some consumer notification before mm -hmm. I run that up. That, that, that is a good point. That is a good point. I guess my, and I, I, I know that my point is a little polarizing because of two things. The first one is I, I, it's not that I agree that Apple is doing this. It's just that I'm, it's horrible. I, have you ever seen a third party fake iPhone display? <laughs> no, I haven't. I mean, like, no, I, so, I, okay. I largely agree with your point. I, I, so, I think 
Apple has one a vested interest in protecting their brand and their reputation that an iPhone should look like an iPhone. And then two, yeah. consumers need to know that there are some significant security risks with mm -hmm. some of this hardware. You don't know what might actually be going into a device that could leech off data or make your device less secure. But what I don't like about Apple's response here is it's not not advising, right? It's it, yeah, it's 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 lack of notification, a lack of awareness, and then it's overly punitive to the people who are already the most vulnerable in their sphere of consumers. Yeah. The people who are already at the most risk of being taken advantage of and now their devices are getting crippled. Yeah, that that, that is a good point. I don't know. I We'll see. I don't know how Apple. The, the thing about it is, the, so the phone is yours. You bought the phone. You have a right to do with that phone whatever you want. And there, there is a legal right to repair. That is true. Uh, I just, I wish that these third-party display manufacturers would be. Oh my God! Like either the displays have zero sensitivity, or they're lacking in sensitivity, or they're yellowish. Yeah. Or they, they're, 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 they look really gross. <laughs> they look really bad, and they charge you seventy bucks for those displays. Uh, so I don't know. I, to a certain degree, I feel that what Apple is doing is not necessarily bad. I just, I have to agree with you. One and two. In addition to notifying the consumer. How about working on establishing places where this repair is not so painful? Because, yeah. uh, like, for example, right now in the Apple Store, if you want to get an appointment, the, the app doesn't give you appointments for more than a week. Um, and they're always jam-packed. It's insane how much they're jam-packed. And sure, you've got the option of Best Buy now and certain other companies. But, uh, you know, there are countries where there are no repair shops. Uh, so I, I, I have to agree with you that definitely Apple needs to find a better balance to do it. Well, I don't think they're paying much attention to that issue as they are to the battery replacement issue. And that, of course, goes back to the whole iPhone th throttling thing. But uh, I'll just throw in this uh, tangentially related uh, story here is that um, uh, 9 to 5 Mac is reporting that Apple stores have had to hire contract work mm -hmm. to have on-site um, uh, people just be able to do it, just to be able to replace those batteries because of the high demand that they're experiencing. Uh, after all, you only get a year to get these uh, replacements done for that subsidized $29 price point. And people understandably are frustrated and they're looking for other sources and otherwise they'd be going to like the will be buying an i fix it kit for 29 dollars, but they have to provide their own labor which is kind of risky in this sort of sense and there are also other like more places but they're untested or less tested and you really don't know what you're getting uh, into like office max and office depot supposedly just started uh, offering uh, the replacements at that twenty nine dollar rate. So, and here's the thing. Here's the thing about that iOS eleven point three update that supposedly helps you with your battery. I mean, my you know my iPhone ten got the update, and because the battery is still new, obviously it just tells you it said maximum performance, and that's it. But right. my my iPad Pro, which is not the latest version, uh, has iOS eleven point three. It's more than a year old, and I have no options to control or not control throttling. And I have noticed that this iPad is slower than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. And, and and by the way, that whole the battery module is still in beta. Uh, for those of you that don't know, yeah. it is still something Apple's testing. Well, and but, it's something that we we've we've already seen sort of cool off in the general discussion, in the general public discussion of something like yeah. this. But it's it's something that I think again just contributes to what is it that you're really getting for your money? How much control do you have over it? And as grownups. What decisions can you make <laughs> with I your product? Point. I love that point, right. definitely. <laughs> well, I mean, well, Peter Hayden makes a good point with the hashtag PN Weekly on Twitter. Uh, I guess it is uh, the leaked parts Apple has to watch out for when these parts are easy to come by. Uh, I guess they don't want to create issues with the brand. Uh, and he links to the how I made my own iPhone in China video. Some of the uh, the guy, I don't remember his name, but he's been making a series of videos about how he's modded his iPhone in, in Shenzhen or whatever. Well, first of wasn't all, this, wasn't China. this the guy who did like how to replace the headphone jack in the yeah. iPhone 7? Yeah, yeah, that too. But uh, also, like, like, but he's been, you know, he's been doing a whole bunch of mods. And yeah. one, good luck if you, the, the, uh, cost of a plane ticket to Shenzhen is um, 
this much so uh good luck to that uh if you don't live in china good luck to you uh oh if you want to go and deal with taobao and want to find you know oh figure God. out that thing without getting ripped off uh, oh, the, wait the, five weeks for the name of the YouTube good channel luck. and i would recommend checking out some of his videos because i think they're crazy entertaining yeah, oh yeah they're, they're crazy cool. great they're cool um, uh so by the way i was in shenzhen a week ago no two weeks ago <laughs> uh and i went to this you could have repaired your, your ipad there I can't rem I can't pronounce the name correctly. Wan Shangpei or That's it's kind of pretty close. It's literally sure. the you know the computer and phone electronics market. Oh my god, there is a full building. Like uh it's funny because I knew that the that the P20 Pro is not gonna ship with a case. Uh nobody, you know, you can't buy this phone. You couldn't buy this phone by then. And I brought like five cases. Like <laughs> oh my god, that that place is insane. And yes, it is full of places for you to replace your screen. You just have to be willing to run a marathon just to find what you want in there. <laughs> oh my god. The, run a marathon, climb a marathon. Like it's it's in climb a marathon. About, uh, it's an insane amount of floors. Uh, there, there's, there's a building that's probably you know uh, the typical size of any building here in New York, uh, and it's just for servers and computer parts and stuff like that. It's insane. Um, we should probably move on. I do want to uh, tackle these last two tweets here on the PN Weekly hashtag from Daniel Mladenov. Uh, not being able to repair your $1,000 phone in some countries does not sound like a premium experience. I agree. Am -O. And then also in those countries where you can't repair that phone, the phone's probably going to cost you a fair bit more than $1,000. Oh, yeah. Um, and then also from Renato Laporte, car manufacturers supply certified parts to any shop that requires them. Why can't electronics manufacturers do the same a good repair a good shop point. cannot get their hands on original parts apple or other oem odm it's almost impossible that's a good point mm -hmm. so plenty of comments there uh, make sure to keep on chiming in for that uh i want to get into our next story here the, our second apple story about uh korean carriers just having to deal with the marketing having to pay up and pay up for good airtime for in-store materials for it's it's the whole kit and caboodle here and they're all standardized and there there's very few you know logos that you can you the carrier can put on there um there's this a fair shake i guess uh obviously the kftc is looking into this what do you think you confused me there yeah uh well i mean so the carriers Sorry. are paying so, well, so it's Apple, just... it, it's it's a little like a car dealership. You know, Apple sends over an advertisement and then it's up to the carrier to pay oh, for oh, all oh. of the airtime. And all they are apparently allowed to do is slap on like a little carrier logo at the very end of the commercial. So like, say you've got two carriers competing in one market. They're showing the exact same ad for the iPhone because they're wanting to advertise to their customers that they have the iPhone. And then at the end, there's just a tiny little you know, plug for their carrier. And and it seems to be ruffling some feathers in, I, like, again, and mostly in how much this stuff costs and, and uh, who has to foot the bill. And all it does is seem to serve Apple as opposed to really helping uh, the marketing situation for uh, the telecoms. But I, I've seen that. And I don't know who pays for these advertisements in, in the United States, but I've seen a ton of ads here where it's the whole full-blown iPhone ad that we already saw from Apple. And then at the end, it's like, get it, buy it on AT&T. Yeah. Which I'm sure that's not something that Apple pushed. I'm sure oh. that it's the carriers that, that you know, they're like, okay, fine. I'll I'll use your ad because you already paid for Chiat Day or whatever uh, marketing <laughs> firm you have. And you already right. did all your homework and everything. They paid for Spike Jones. Yeah, so we have Apple doing their own advertisement. And then at the end, I don't know, man. It's it's Each country has their own ways, man. Because uh, I, I, I see that. I actually see more of those ads than I see Apple direct ads without a carrier information at the end. Oh, totally. And and I wonder what would be the local political or legal situation involving creating your own ads? Because I mean, look at like T-Mobile commercials. I think T-Mobile more aggressively brands product launches. Mm -hmm. So when a new phone shows up on T-Mobile, it's a T-Mobile commercial that features whatever new phone might be available to their customers. And I'm curious why that doesn't seem to be as as a uh, prominent a solution in uh, in Korea. Why? you know we've got this sort of a westerner sensibility commercial which being which is being produced for european and american audiences 
And so we're just going to take that material and run it for Korean distribution doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. No, unless there's sense. something which prevents that. I don't know if there's something which precludes them cutting their own advertisements, which I, I can't imagine what that would be. And I'm just not I'm not versed at all in Korean law. Um, Same what here. their broadcast standards are. But it, it's it seems like to me like the instead of complaining about this is the ad we get from Apple and we're allowed to run from Apple, we're just going to talk about our products and our services on our own. And maybe we feature a product like an iPhone. I don't know. Maybe the brand guidelines from Apple are just that strict and the carriers being yeah. kind yeah. of now, uh, confound. If Apple, is putting, if Apple is putting ridiculous restrictions on their ability to feature their products and advertisements for their carrier, then I do think the carriers have a good faith argument to be made in their local legal arena. But that's also to the same token is, but like if if there's any wiggle room or any wrangle room or any legal loophole in in doing business in a way that's still in good faith um featuring products in advertisements for their carrier then i would say just take that opportunity and run with it otherwise completely devalue the iphone in your market and see what you can do to i don't know bolster up like a local player like you know lg could use a little help <laughs> oh yeah totally <laughs> But, you know, remains to be like since the, you know, Apple's growing its presence in Korea and, you know, their uh, iPhones are growing a little bit in popularity at the very least. You know, the, Apple seems to be wanting to gain more control of its narrative in the market there. So maybe totally. uh, before before we leave Apple real quick, uh, Jaime, I was wondering, did you get to spend any time with a HomePod? No, I I declined doing anything <laughs> for it. <laughs> <clears throat> so I I actually I I've spent time with it. Uh, I actually ordered one and I returned it two days later. Um, and the main reason why I did it is because it, uh, as much of a user I am of Apple products, uh, I use a lot of Apple hardware. I'm not really much of a, pan, a fan of Apple services. And so, you know, the the biggest limitation with the HomePod is Siri on the HomePod is trash. It's mm it's even more limited than than pretty much anything. Like I have a Google Home Mini. Thank you, Jules. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's just, I don't know, that is probably, I feel more complete, even though it's significantly less expensive. And then, uh, oh my God, like it only, it only allows me to use things like Apple Music. I don't like Apple Music. I'm a Spotify customer. Mm. And so if you're, whereas in, in the Google Home Mini, I could just be like, uh, play my Spotify. It'll, and I actually can tell the app, this is the music app that I want to use. Um, and so, you know, it's fine for you to give me uh, a speaker that's $100 that's forced, that forces me to use Apple services because, I mean, hey, it's just $100. But, you know, like I said in the daily two days ago, I'm like, it's a speaker. It's 350 bucks, and I can't choose what I do with it. Like, seriously, no, thank you. I mean, you well, can it's be the most amazing. Expand your apartment. It's supposed it, to like bring the walls away and make you but, dance. But, I, like, but I'm, not no gonna, I'm not going to use Apple of music. Yourself. I am not going to use Apple Music, and that's just the thing. I I don't like their app. I you know, and so if you have a, a speaker that forces me to use your services, then fine. Could you please at least? charge me a lot less for the speaker, regardless of how much technology you punch into it, because you're going to make more money through the services. I mean, the, 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 the speaker becomes the hardware that opens the door to the services. And so you subsidize the speaker with the amount of money you'll make through that, through that. So I, well, that's the reason I'm like, I can't even use this. I'm not even going to review this. Oh my God. Like yeah. get it out of here. Well, that, that that's actually never been is... Apple's way though. Well, that really right. segues nicely into Spotify's plan and trying to move into the automotive space. Uh, do you think uh, an LTE connected puck for your Spotify habit would uh, would deliver for your car? For your car, um, let's be sure. So, so here's uh, here's an interesting. You know, when I when I saw the when I saw the news about that, I was like, okay, I don't understand. So, have you guys noticed from your vehicles how terrible the you know whatever systems in your cars are? Well, I, I yeah. my, I'm rocking like a mid-level Bose system in my little Nissan. Oh, it's so okay. so I'm I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure you're able like, to spend five hundred dollars uh, to no, replace no, no, the head. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm sure the audio quality is amazing. I'm asking about the experience ever came in your car. 
Oh yeah, no, no, no. The, the the Nissan Touch Panel center console thing, the entertainment head is is garbage. It's I absolute just, garbage. So I drive I drive a Mazda CX nine. It's a gorgeous car, but like the head unit is like the whole experience of pairing a phone with it is a nightmare. Oh, um, not even pairing it. So like I I, I have like a little USB uh, flash storage drive just to keep like my daughter's favorite music easily. Yeah. Accessible no matter what i don't have to fire it up from my phone i can just punch it in my wife used it for the first we've had this car for over a year and my wife used the in dash unit to try and find her music uh, for the very first time last week the 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 drive that we were in it, it was going to take us 15 minutes to get to a restaurant to meet up with some family and friends mm -hmm. and it took her the entire 15 minute drive to navigate to play one song from moana my daughter crying in the back seat the whole time. And I'm just sitting there going like, you've got to learn. <laughs> you've got to figure it out. I can try and talk you through it. And but, but it was awful. It, yeah. it was the worst uh, multimedia experience I think I've ever seen watching someone try and do that. And this is what you're supposed to use while you're operating a motor vehicle. A motor vehicle. Is, like, so, so here's the thing. I feel that there is so much opportunity in this market. Uh, I just, I, I'm really upset at the fact that if you want to get a car with CarPlay or Android Auto, uh, you can't get it at the, I, I've noticed that you can't really get it at the like mid-level or lower tier. You have to buy like an expensive car if you want to get yeah. these features or you have to feature this in and then, or, you know, and some of these cars don't allow both services. Some of these cars don't give you the option to use both Android Auto and, and, um, you know, CarPlay. And so here's the thing. I'm like, I don't know exactly what Spotify wants to do, but again, the experience right now is so bad. I'm like, show me the money. I mean, just show me what you're going to do. Uh, I, I can't wait to see what you're going to do. If it's good enough, then fine. And if it's not, then we'll move on. We'll see. We True. shall see. Sorry. All right. Uh, let's uh, hit up on the LG V35 thing. Thank you. Uh, Thank again. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank and you. The, welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> the V35. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I believe the V30 Plus, which is out right now, is uh, being called the V35 in Japan for some good reason, I would hope, because they're weird like that. They had, well, like, LG's that always, small... had, always had an odd separate strategy for Japan. I yeah. mean, yeah, they had that small V20 that was waterproof, and then they called yeah. it the V34. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, let's uh, dig into this. Uh, we're getting the stuff from uh, Android Headlines, which apparently is re relying on a, a very uh, reliable source here. Uh, thank you, AI camera uh, with a camera brightness and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, artificial intelligence and computational photography uh, has been the most obvious, I would say, in terms of the integrations going in. Most complex, of course, yeah. because I'm dealing with lots of data. I'm tired of the topic. I'm tired of going to presentations and hearing AI, 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 AI battery, uh, AI photos, AI whatever, and all. You know, I'm glad that it can tell it's a plant. Um, <laughs> why, why, why? Okay, so I'll just say this. Um, I love, I love it. So I feel that smartphones have this amazing opportunity that typical cameras can't bring, and it's the fact that they have smarter brains. Um, and so I like this whole approach of pointing my Huawei phone at something and have it detect and adapt. That's for me, that's true intelligent auto, as opposed to just whatever color it's metering for, it'll expose or underexpose or this or that. The problem is, particularly with LG products lately, I mean, I was a big fan of the V20. I I like the G6 to a certain degree, but then the V30, the V30 is a beautiful phone. Um it's a beautiful phone. It's great to handle. But, you, you know, one of the reasons why I didn't even review the V30S Think Q, uh, V30S, V30S Plus Think Q, You're welcome. is because, oh, my God, there are horrible issues with the display. Just uh, the, how, it's not screen burn. How do you call that? Like persistence? Or image retention. Image retention. And so if you set up the always on display, uh, it'll persist on the UI when you unlock the phone, which was a problem that didn't happen with the V30. Um, and so I'm like, really, LG? I mean, you had all this time to launch this phone, 
and you literally didn't fix anything but add more RAM and more storage. Uh, no Snapdragon 845, which actually is the only processor that's capable of act of being able to push the 10-bit sensor on that camera. So that camera has capabilities that the processor can't push. And so I'm like, what is the point? What's the purpose of this phone? Um, it's a stopgap measure, and it's and it's a fairly apparent and obvious one, which is disappointing from a company that um, we've been. I mean, I think you and I have been fans of for yes. like, especially the V20 era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it came to multimedia, really trying to drive. Uh, it was my spare microphone for the longest time. Yeah. Ever since you taught me that it was that good, man. Totally. You know, so, uh, this is this is one of the things that. Again, th this is a, a cranky conversation like we used to have about Microsoft back in the day where we're watching a company with more than enough potential, mm -hmm. more than enough expertise, and they're dropping the ball at the one yard line down after down after down after down. Again, I want to be excited about a V35 because I think LG could do really well with a TikTok strategy. Don't reinvent the wheel every year. Focus on a couple key aspects that you can improve, but keep the overall platform from what worked before. But yeah. then you put out this half measure, the, the V30S, where we're seeing consistency issues. We're seeing QA problems. And uh, quality problems, consistency problems, is something that has been linked with the LG brand since the G4. Yeah. So if we're not seeing them improve there, it, it makes us extremely gun shy as to what kind of a recommendation we can give a product with generation after generation after generation of problems and terrible that... selfie cameras <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrible well, selfie cameras you know what's sad is like going back and i was playing with my v10 and like the dual camera strategy is a good idea it is so many ripping they, that off for the they XA. Much, that's a good idea they pretty much came up with the whole idea i mean yeah. how so much innovation coming from lg and it's just this whole fumbling of leadership and, and all these changes it's like you know, the company is so successful in their TVs and they're so successful selling parts to Apple, but it seems that the company doesn't is not putting enough effort in being successful in everything that they do. Yeah. Their ad, their advertisement needs work. Uh, their, you know, I, I wish that their displays, you know, LG is probably the new Sony, I guess. Where no, LG, LG is the HTC of this time. Well, uh, but, and we can add Sony there where, you know, and the reason why I say Sony is because <laughs> How, how is it that every other smartphone has a better camera experience than Sony phones and all the sensors are Sony? I'm like, what? It, isn't it supposed to be the, uh, the other way around? And, right. you know, or, Jackie Chan there. You, you did the, you did the what thing. Yeah, the, the, I, wow. I, I, I could try it again. What? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Oh. I, uh, I am, I'm looking forward to see what LG does next from their new leadership. And I hope it's not that this new leadership change is not an excuse to rush something that is not well-baked. Yeah. Well, I, we are I, six I, months out of this, so uh, that's I, I some think, thoughts. I, I really think LG taking a knee, holding out and refining a product line until it is like certain, ready to compete. And especially in the second half of the year. I really don't think LG does well trying to rush to compete at the, you know, in quarters one and two. If they can get some good uh, deals on resources, chipsets, RAM components, things like that, then I think they have a much stronger play in the second half of the year. They can usually beat Apple to a product announcement. And if they've had that entire lead up for manufacturing in place through the first half of the year, then we won't play this will they, won't they game. This is the thing that I think has been killing LG since... Uh, since the G uh, since the V20 has been let's announce a product and then let's not tell you when it'll ship or how much it's going to cost for at least six weeks and then we're after the point where you've heard about pixels and iPhones so you've probably already bought that phone but then we'll finally get the V or the next G series phone out and now they can't even tell us like what the replacement phone will be the the off again on again rumors that we see for the g7 or the g7 thank you or the g7s or yeah. whatever this thing's going to be called or wherever it's going to show up i say scrap all of that have a two-tier premium strategy that launches you know quarter three 2019 call it you know the the v the v40 and the v40 plus yeah we all know that we all understand what that means you've got a little phone you've got a big phone 
they all have the same features. They have the same chipsets, similar screens, same camera stuff. And one has a bigger screen and a bigger battery. And it abbreviates so much of the conversation because you're not going to train consumers to understand what think you is as a brand label. That doesn't mean anything. No. And you're not going to you're not going to win any hearts and minds with that. You know, no. like no one's going to see that and think, oh, well, that's an artificially intelligent camera system on a smartphone. Like uh, it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I just I find this level of oddity where companies are just so like I I hate to reference Apple, but I think this is the best example. Mm -hmm. When Steve Jobs took over the company, Apple was horribly outclassed by Microsoft products. And, you know, the first thing that Steve Jobs came to do was like, you know, forget about the competition. Let's focus on being Apple. Let's try to do something that's unique. And then we've got every smartphone OEM. Oh, uh, uh, the iPhone 10's got a notch. It's a stupid idea, but let's all get a notch. Let's yeah. all do the notch. I mean, are you serious? And that's see, the best is, you could come up with. And see, this is the reason why I like what Samsung is doing. Samsung is not trying to follow ship. They are being Samsung. And they are being Samsung in a couple of interesting ways uh you know not just from a design perspective like the company has really invested in the whole concept of smart things i mean we do tvs we do refrigerators some of these even tweet uh i'm sure they're working on the android powered toaster behind the scenes and we just don't know about this um and so you know one of the biggest pushes with the galaxy s9 was the whole idea of smart things we now have a smartphone that connects to everything and i like walking into my apartment and know oh, it detects the tv and it detects this and you know this is the i'm like you know this is lg makes some of the best televisions i've seen <laughs> and their phones don't talk to their tvs like i'm like really like come on uh, and it's and it's just fun because it, it, it's just weird because they were the first company to come up with the whole concept with the G5 of the friends, you know, different yeah. things that would interact with the phone, and then this phone would do this. And they come up, they came up with the most uh, awesome concept for VR with that, you know, those goggles. And what happened to these products? Like, what happened to these ideas? Uh, I I don't know. Yeah, we got a couple tweets <laughs> yeah. here. We did get the uh, the Go Jackie Chan. Uh, what? <laughs> uh, image from Shimon Das. Uh, so, uh, from at Danny Kelly 84, uh, hashtag PN Weekly. Love the cameras on my G6. Hate the display. Hate the lack of updates. Adding a lame AI branding isn't going to persuade me to buy a G7. And again, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think I there are a lot too. of consumers that feel left out in the cold when their products aren't being properly supported or properly maintenance. And then to your point, I'm tired of sort of following the footsteps of other companies. I want to see companies that are actually trying to create their own. I think your Samsung example is hilarious because think about where we were Galaxy S days and Samsung being like the, the most cited brand for copying Apple. Yeah. Ta you know, Apple taking Samsung to court over UI design. And they've now actually managed to find a design language and a conversation with their computers, which is unique to Samsung. Whether you love them, whether you hate them, a Samsung product stands for something which is wholly different than I just want to have an iPhone-like device that runs Android. It's it's yeah. a unique, completely unique and separate experience from that conversation. No, and, so. and I understand that that strategy works in China where people are just so... They're so focused on the iPhone that, but they, you know, sometimes they just can't afford it that whatever product looks like it, you know, Oppo changed their strategy. In the past, they had like the Find series and everything. Mm -hmm. And then they realized that these products didn't really sell. And then they started making devices that look like the iPhone. And that's when they started gaining momentum. So I totally understand selfie phones. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 to I totally understand the concept. I, I totally understand the purpose for it. It's just that doesn't really work in every market. Uh, you know, I think they should have their iPhone clones for China and for whatever, whatever markets are focused on that and then focus on bringing some value and some differentiation to the market. I mean, LG has got probably the most interesting innovation portfolio that I've seen in smartphones from the audio quality to, you know, the whole concept of dual cameras and the back cameras. Uh, I'm not going to mention their terrible selfie camera, but just, you know, they provide a lot of value, value that other OEMs don't provide. And yet they don't bank on that. They focus on things that are not relevant. Completely. Um, yeah. So we know you're going to have to get going here pretty soon. So, uh, Jules, we should probably talk about the security patch situation before uh, 
before Jaime has to bolt. Oh yeah, uh, if you definitely. can talk so a little quick before we jump in. Yeah. So again, the security research labs, uh, a couple of researchers there have uh, tracked over. 1200 phones over the past year uh and uh some of them have been engaging in uh very in, in, at the very least misleading at the very worst deceptive uh, practices when it comes to these patches of course um we're talking about these uh, security patches from google uh 2015 after uh the stage fright incident they've been making a big priority about releasing them monthly and ever since then some carriers, uh, bar, like some manufacturers, barring carrier status, you know, having to maintain the, the update, have been releasing them at a very frequent pace. Um, now, what actually gets patched? Well, that could be uh, related to uh, holes that are uh, have been well created for whatever reason, but they're not all getting patched, and that's the key point here. Like, uh, oh, so let's get this. They're getting patched. They're just not getting any real patch. It's just the software update. That's not really a software update. Is that sometimes a uh, sometimes, very few yeah. of them? Yeah, they just uh, ed- like type in instead of o four for the month o five for May. That like that's that's how they or, get through. Or and that's if I'm reading this correctly, it could be say there was a comprehensive security patch suite. So a number of security issues were addressed in one major update from month to month that that update might not fully encompass by the time it filters through the manufacturer it might not fully encompass everything that the consumer gets yeah wow. i mean well, one particular example the galaxy j5 last year or the 2016 model uh was actually honest about its record it had uh this month's patch but not last month's or something like that and then the galaxy j3 same model year 2016 claimed to have patches for every update it received but it actually lacked 12 patches total and two of them were critical (laughs) wow so So, you're you're talking um, about a big difference there so we we've had this conversation a lot it feels you know again one of for better for worse one of the major advantages of the the closed off ecosystem of the iphone is i find it highly dubious that we would ever ever be talking about something like this on an iphone but it's happened i mean nothing not not, not like where apple says hey we fixed that critical vulnerability and then they actually hadn't i mean there have been situations where apple products haven't gotten um so i mean i always look at like the mac defender bugs where it took months months for apple to address something that a similar exploit in the windows ecosystem was fixed in days um so so there definitely are issues there but i seriously doubt i i can't think of a single time where Apple has published, we have fixed the this exploit and we have published the, the fix out to our consumers and then that turned out to be completely spurious or completely false. And and I, I get it. Um, for me, it's, it's incredibly disappointing because OEMs are still, there is the word adamant, uh, like when something is forceful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. They are so adamant about their user interfaces. They want to push it in your face and then they can't keep up with the demand or the requirements of the own poison they've already chosen. I'll give you an example of a company that does the complete opposite and is being incredibly successful, Nokia. They're mm-hmm. not dealing with that stuff anymore. They went through they went for Android 1 where that is no longer their problem. All they focus on is making incredible hardware and that's it. Uh, and, you know, as opposed to the theory that every OEM had uh, where, yeah, we need uh, our, our own user interface for reasons I don't understand, you know, Nokia is proving that you don't. And they're being like, oh, my God, Nokia, we were covering the news in, in, at MWC. Nokia has sold an insane amount of phones. Yeah. You know, uh, they're, we're waiting for them to, like, fully push the United States. But they're doing a lot of things right right now. And, and one of them is just not dealing with something that they can't control. They don't have the infrastructure right now to control that. And they just don't want that problem. I mean, what's the point of lying about a, a, a security patch? Why do you want to deal with that sort of bad publicity? Why not just get rid of the problem? You know, good consumers. Good yeah, a good note to have here is that uh, a lot of these are component level, and that gets passed along to the manufacturers and whatnot. MediaTek being the biggest offender here, with mm-hmm. they produce a lot of low cost chips. Uh, now it's it's noted that Nokia does uh, 
have uh, MediaTek powered phones, but even then they're on the relatively low side of uh, the missing patch levels, averaging one to three missing patches uh, per device. So, and they're in the ranks with Xiaomi and OnePlus, mm -hmm. which in themselves are pretty good at just keeping things updated. So, you know, good on them. But when you're surprised to see, you know, HTC, Huawei, LG, Motorola, uh, TCL, ZTE, uh, ZTE being a particular one in the US because they've been trying to get things through and, you know, just to yeah, excel. I mean, that, that's a bad look, especially after that recent law enforcement advisory against ZTE and Huawei to be seeing any kinds of shenanigans with critical exploits. The, the company yeah. I'd be really interested to see how the breakdown on individual devices happens would be TCL. Mm -hmm. Because if there's an issue between BlackBerry software and TCL hardware manufacturing, then that could be a very big deal. And again, for me, having been such a big advocate of the key one, if you want to make me super cranky really fast on a BlackBerry <laughs> device, that would be the way to do it. But that'd be but, to start screwing with people's security patches. But and here's the thing about BlackBerry. I mean, has your key one received the Oreo update? No, mine hasn't. So here's yeah. the thing. I mean, what was the promise that BlackBerry made when we were in their briefing? Well, actually, I thought that they were pretty upfront about saying we're not going to be, we're never going to be first to getting new but, operating systems out. But I have been a little disappointed recently with the the turnaround time on month to month updates. Like that to me has always been a bigger play for BlackBerry was to say we're going to be on on the pulse and we're going to be yeah. as as aggressive as we can with these bug fixes, though yeah. we might be behind the curve on the full OS. And lately, that hasn't felt like that's been as a... I tracked a lot of praise initially for the first maybe six, seven, eight months, and it the feels the like it felt really good. Yeah, 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 and it feels like it, there's been kind of a dearth in that kind of news lately. So. Which is yeah. odd considering that they haven't been making a ton of noise. We haven't been seeing rumors about a key too. Like that seems to be when a company starts to, you know, back off the aggressiveness. Give the slack, yeah. A, well, an older well, device. Well, well, didn't we we covered the leaks of a possible key too? Recently. Yeah, it's starting to oh, come yeah, out. But yeah. but again, it was like you know, what was the code name for the first key one that they said? This is not our code name, but we'll talk oh, about our phones. Uh, shoot mercury <laughs> mercury and they're like oh it's not called no mercury, such device but, it's, but, but if you, you guys call it mercury fine let's call it mercury <laughs> <laughs> and now this one's being called athena or something so yeah so so i just mean i i don't i don't mean that there haven't been rumors or leaks i just mean we haven't seen that same sort of burning oh, what what are they going to do what are they going to do this is going to be like the first hot thing and i i would expect some correlation with the quality of software support for a well over a year old phone mm -hmm. as we're seeing a lot of noise or a lot of information being generated about its successor and that hasn't seemed to be the case um yeah. you know again it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the frustrations i have with lg and samsung you know you like samsung it's almost a parody or a joke for the company You're like oh yeah you want oreo we'll just wait until the new phone comes out and that's the best <laughs> the easiest way to get the new operating system on your phone oh yeah and we'll eventually get around to updating an older phone too um lg just you might never see <laughs> any kind of update there either it, it's it's well, in I these mean, critical patches and these because... bug fixes that i've been most disappointed though and the only the only sure game in town seems to be Google. Well, it's odd because LG has uh, started to commit itself to software updates. They just they opened a freaking software upgrade center at one of their new campuses in Seoul, mm -hmm. and, and we and so we haven't worked, worked in weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So now it's going to be apparently a priority. They're going to dedicate the hundreds of people it needs when already you have these outfits like Xiaomi and like the, all the Chinese carriers, uh, Chinese manufacturers too, that have the people to just, you know, ax away at all the the craft and stuff with uh, the, the software updates. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh well um no I, this this is something i don't know i mean do you think that this is the kind of long-term conversation that will eventually resonate with consumers we've got hearings about data privacy and data security for facebook happening at the federal government level we've oh. got people who are leaving or uh or especially the medical conversation saying like hey if you turn off social media your stress levels drop do yeah. you think that that the hardware side of this the manufacturer side of this 
a story like that could resonate because I have family and friends where I don't want them having to worry about their security setup. And an iPhone now makes a lot more sense for them who are concerned enough about their their data and their privacy to, uh, to buy a certain product. I'm glad you bring up the Facebook topic because uh, the news today are that regardless of all the mess and everything that's happening, people continue using Facebook. Like there have not been, there has not been a significant drop in consumers using Facebook. Uh, I guess the, the have you seen the the the, the hearings, the congressional yeah, hearings? Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen the congressional hearings. It's and laughable. I, yeah, but okay. So let's ask ourselves the question: Why? Why is it that? Uh, why is it that people know that there is a security threat and they continue using Facebook? Um, I guess uh, this, so. There's this interesting video from Vox that I really liked over how you know, how that lock-in works so well, uh, mm -hmm. how people, it's funny because, you know, the newer generations are not using Facebook. My son doesn't use Facebook. All of his friends don't use Facebook. For them, their social media is Snapchat. That's what they use. Uh, if anything, they'll use Instagram. They're, they're starting to use more Instagram now, but they care less about Facebook. The problem is what demographics are currently using Facebook. My dad loves it. <laughs> my, you know, my, my stepmother loves it. And, you know, I've noticed that older generations continue using Facebook. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it's just that the, the the way these companies lock you into the service where it comes to the point where people don't care about their privacy more than they care about being part of something. Um, and so in the case of smartphones, you know, the problem is you've already bought, a, you know, somehow marketing was able to convince you to buy X phone. And, and, you know, in certain countries, buying another phone is just so expensive and that the cycles where you can replace that phone will take so long. So what happens if you know that you've bought uh, a phone from a brand that doesn't guarantee your security? Can you just go out if you're already past the 14 day window and just return that phone? Can you go past the, you know, no, you can't. You, you're you stuck with that phone. You can try to sell it on eBay or whatever, but the problem is you're stuck with that phone. And so, you know, that's that's the reason why for many people, I'm like, listen, if you don't want to deal with a ton of things, just get an iPhone or get a Pixel. It's what I tell people. Uh, but then the one that's most accessible to them is the iPhone because the Pixel you can only find on Verizon. Uh, you know, financing is not always available. And so you, 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 the, converse, the thing about the conversation, Juan, it's just the problem is so broad. <laughs> Like yeah. fixing the problem is just requires such a broad solution. The question is, what do you do? Uh, people are extremely locked to Facebook just as much as they're extremely locked to that phone that is costing them so much money and that, that they can't just get rid of. So I feel that the conversation, just like what's happening with the con congressional hearings and forcing Facebook because, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about the whole thing of what's been happening to Facebook, for example, and I'm like, okay. Facebook created a tool that can harvest data and people freely provide that data. And Facebook has figured out a way to get people to feel compelled to share that data. So I do agree that Facebook is liable because they've created the tool and then the business is to share the data. But then you come to the point where you're like, okay, yes, but Facebook is not Cambridge Analytica. It's not Facebook that used the data to, you know, to harm uh, you know, democracy or stuff like that. So, you know, there, there's more than just one person liable. What I feel like is, uh, you know, oh, sorry. Um, I feel that Congress and governments should make OEMs liable for what they're providing. Uh, well, and especially in cases of disclosure, especially yes. when we're seeing a manufacturer operate. I, I feel that you're not operating in good faith when you say no. we, have, we have patched this vulnerability and then you haven't. No, that to me, like, I, I'm actually shocked that this story didn't come with, hey, there's a class action lawsuit brewing. Yeah. And so that, that's the thing. I feel that just this example is being set with, with Facebook should be set with OEMs, uh, where OEMs have to understand that they can play as much as they want with their hardware. But software is the experience and consumers to serve security. And it's their responsibility to provide the security. It's not something negotiable. It's not something that they could just, you know, brush off under the rug if they're, if they, you know, either, you know, there's, there's a funny saying in aviation where you can't play with this. In aviation, whenever you go certify an airline for the first time, the phrase they'll tell you is, this is not a business for poor people. 
You either have right. the infrastructure to do this right, or you can withdraw your application right which, now. Which also, it doesn't seem to be, I mean, again, I, I don't want to say it's a direct causal uh, relationship, but there does seem to be a significant correlation that a lot of the devices that are not receiving the support that has been announced are mid-range and lower cost devices. Again, yeah. you're paying for something when you start buying a premium phone and the people who are already the most vulnerable in our society or the people who stand to benefit the most from purchasing a less expensive device are the ones who are being left out in the cold for future support, for future updates, for progress, and also making sure that their data can be protected too. And that's entirely lopsided. You know, when you look at economies around the world, now it's it's like that's even more insidious. I want to hold those companies to an even higher standard on the lesser expensive devices that they put out. Now, let me ask you a question. I mean, we go the reason why I put the Facebook example and how Cambridge Analytica was the one that pulled the data. Think about this. Um, who is responsible for Android? Google. Google. OK, they've created this open source platform where every OEM can do whatever they want with it. Um, or they can abide to whatever Google is doing and just not deal with it. Shouldn't Google be liable to a certain degree into forcing OEMs? Like, listen, you want to use Android? It's fine. You can do whatever you want with it, but you are forced to comply with these timetables, and if not, you will be banned from using Android or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think we're long past that time. I, I, Google, in trying to prevent exodus and trying to prevent competition because i mean think about it that now becomes a corporation's biggest asset isn't yeah. can we build the best product it's how can we best prevent competition in our space that yeah. that's become sort of the capitalist uh yeah. you know fighting metric i think that's, that's most used um and apple has a perfect solution they have a monopoly on ios <laughs> you know like they have zero there is no competition for an iphone but they're ta they've taken responsibility for their own but they've taken responsibility for it because they do have competition for smartphones and this yeah. is also where google ran into problems in the way that they originally entered into this uh relationship with manufacturers saying hey you know like you had microsoft you had palm you have apple there are all these different outlets and a lot of companies were making software we'll let you do what you want but there are some guidelines we need you to follow for Google apps. But they're only oriented they towards Google. They the but only that's... the only benefit is to Google. It's not for the consumer. No, no, no. And but that's how that's how they tried to rein in bad actors. Yeah. Because you know Google is a service. What? Well, they still are mainly a services company, not a hardware company. Um, but that's how they would try and rein in bad actors. If you want access to the best services on the internet, and people were all about Gmail and Google Maps and, and everything that they had to offer there, you at least had to abide by some of these requirements before you put your phone out. But then after that, you could do whatever you want. Every successive generation of Android has tried little baby steps to rein that in. And I think it's time that they just pulled the plug. Yeah. I, I, you know, you can, you can weather the storm of people running off to use a Tizen powered Galaxy phone. You you can you can play that game, uh, and and Samsung would be silly to just completely abandon Android and try and convince everyone that their next phone should not run Google services on it. Um, but what 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 I think is going to be increasingly difficult is to try and have this legitimate face to face conversation with consumers and say it's okay that a ton of players in this space and especially lower and mid range devices are completely not getting the support that they're claiming to just real quick on Facebook though, um, for you, uh, Jaime, uh, in many markets, Facebook adoption has completely flatlined and we are actually starting to see a, a, a very, very small contingent of users, um, walking away from Facebook as a platform. So we've, we've already demonstrated that they can't have permanent growth. Like there are just a finite number of people on the planet with computers. Um, but we are actually starting to see the beginning. So when Zuckerberg's in front of uh, this committee and he, you know, they ask him point blank, has you, have you seen a significant reduction in user activity? That's not actually the important metric. It's, it's no. you can't show growth. You can't you aren't getting new users on the platform. Young people aren't really flocking to Facebook to no. use it in any significant or meaningful fashion. And we are starting to see the very beginnings of people walking away from the platform. Yeah. So that that's a bad place for a social network to be 
if they can't turn that around. And they'll have to leverage uh, WhatsApp and Instagram a lot heavier uh, to, to keep up with uh, trafficking in user data. Yeah, which they haven't done to any good extent because Instagram's still relatively insulated from all the other than ads. But like, and even if they can't grow in terms of usership, like they still need eyeballs to see the ads that these uh, providers are dishing out. And if that's the case, if the you know growth is not happening, then. Uh, or if there is a decline, which would be even more, which would be the worrisome case, because you know steady growth, or st- because the, you can still have targeted sub audiences, and all in all, the I think the the ad providers would be generally happy if they can get a good amount of those. But if there's a market decline, then there would be something to be worried about here. Now, if we were to just toss everything out and uh, make this a universal standard and just make sure that all the CV, uh, CVEs are covered, like involve the freaking commerce uh, Department of Commerce. Let's get the NS, uh, NIST on this and let's just make that happen. Let's make Google, Apple, everyone else follow the same damn rules. No, no I'm not going to lie. I am I guess I am happy. I'm I'm not happy with what happened. I'm happy that there is a level of, you know, that people are right now opening their eyes to just, oh my God, like social media, social media is great for many things, for finding old friends and for things like that. But I know people that literally only live on social media that don't Mm -hmm. have a, that don't have a life beyond it. Um, And it's all about what you show at the moment And then that's not, you know, a lot of people, you know, particularly where I'm from, it's very common for people to live a life that they don't live. (laughs) Like, but, you know, a photo can't really capture your life. It just captures a moment. Um, And, you know, I I feel that there should be better ways. I mean, I, I hate getting on the subway and seeing everybody on their phone. And it's instead of having a conversation with the person that's right there in front of them, all they're doing is chatting with somebody that's halfway across the world or in another portion of the city, you know. And, it, well, and gonna, just, like the, the person across from you is going to stick a shiv in you. Like that's right. the expected but why? interaction. In but why? What caused all this? Like you know, what caused all this? Uh, I mean, because the, the, there there is a blessing and a curse. I mean, I, for every yeah. person who says like I I I you know I miss the days when you would just interact with people on the subway. There are those amazing photos from like post World War II era. Oh, you saw that? You saw that? Where people just all have newspapers up in front of their faces and they aren't interacting with each other and stuff like that too. And and you know you get on you get on uh, like uh, the metro or you you go to DC and you'll see everyone's just sort of quietly like keeping to themselves and it's become sort of taboo to be loud or try and you know shake up someone else's day they might be well, there's reading a, a book certain social or you know sociology in co- like close quarters mass people in co- close quarters as opposed to like a more open space with uh transient people and just like you dealing one-on-one with another person so i don't know but that's just me and my you know not degree happening there uh you can you can move on now mm-hmm but I mean, your, your, your point larger taken is finding a balance, I feel, between the communities that we can build for each other online. You know, yeah. the echo chamber of the like minded is a really safe place to be. But then also being able to engage at the local level or the community level or just the face to face level again is something that I hope we don't lose. And, mm-hmm. and that I feel actually in, what, what's funny is that I actually feel more emboldened from people younger than the current millennial like the generation coming after millennials, I feel actually has a better understanding and a better balance of what to expect from digital online media and broadcast and how to be active, proactive in their communities. Um, What we've seen from recent political debates, I feel they actually have a better handle on this than many people my age and older do. So, you know, again, it's taken us the, the, the period of time from the iPod to the 10th anniversary of the iPhone is such a brief window to analyze trends over time and the impact on society. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the generations of people coming after this, coming after this point, are already evolving to better meet the uh, the conflicts and the problems associated with this technology. And I feel it will get better from that point too, as society finally figures out what to do with all this stuff. And we've seen some uh, some terrific examples of how poorly uh, it can be used, of how of how mm-hmm. badly. It can be used in the public sphere. Um, but we just have to weather that storm 
along the way. You know, it's not to say that, oh, well, we just won't do anything and we'll wait for, you know, my grandkids to figure it out. It's how do we meaningfully join the conversation so that people who are most impacted by this are better armed to deal with it when it does rear its ugly head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of kids get this stuff thrust into their laps and just have to find a way to handle it and ride the bull as it is. And, uh, well, last for a life, lifetime. I mean, these effects, you know, the recession or maybe we'll a see, war we'll or see. something like that. That's always something to, you know, it's a big deal to be able to just grapple onto it. So, yeah, um, we'll this, see. I, uh, this conversation I, I, lasts more than a podcast. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but I, I love, I, I, I agree with your point, Juan. I mean, I love that my son is, he is against using Facebook. He is against it. Like yeah, he my my like... my daughter has, I believe we're still at four photos that are publicly visible of her on Facebook, and that's just to family and friends. That's not yeah. like public public. Um, she has zero presence on social media. I grew up with zero presence on social media, and I feel like she should be allowed to make the same dumb baby little kid mistakes that I was allowed to make without my parents broadcasting it to the whole world Agreed. for imaginary internet points. Um, imaginary <laughs> internet points. I love that. I love that. That is so true. <clears throat> and and as she gets older, then we'll have those conversations of like, how are your peers communicating with each other and how can you join that conversation and what's the safest way to do that? And I'm not afraid of her picking this stuff up. You know, like I'm not afraid of her figuring out how technology works. You know, kids yeah. are pretty smart. Yeah. Um, I'm more afraid of having an entire backlog of years of embarrassing material that will be easily searched, cross-referenced and logged um, with her not being able to have any say and in used. how or who, who in how it's used. Exactly. Yeah. Especially from organizations that profit from uh, her behavior. Yeah. So so that to me became the again, a little of that is tinfoil hat, but not a lot of it, as we've seen in how different companies have been able to leverage this information despite Facebook's uh, security yeah. protocols. You know what be more tinfoil hat than that? The 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 theory that pr having privacy will be shameful in like the next 30 years. Huh. I, I kind of feel like that. You know, I, I, I totally appreciate that as one component of the debate i think another component of that though is going to be privacy through obscurity like as as privacy erodes on certain at certain points and in certain levels i just how much are you going to care to investigate someone or dig into someone's personal life or True. try and find information on someone i feel like there is going to be a multiple pronged approach to how we discuss what is publicly available and what isn't um, and judging Moro compasses on the dedication to you know the what levels you're trying to access information. No, and, and you know we, I was having this conversation the other day with a couple of friends, and you know the topic was um, why you know why don't I personally use my Instagram to um, you know to market things? Uh, uh, I it's a trend. It's what a lot of people are doing, and I get it. It's just. I, I find that so. I I, find, I remember when I was in college, and you know, just my my uh, you know the the teachers were like, oh, you know, we have to we have to fly this trend of of marketing on social media. It's the new boom and everything. And I'm like, oh man, like, can I please go somewhere where something is not being sold to me? You know, can I just be? Can I can my Instagram just be a normal way for me to? I don't know, show what I'm doing, but not necessarily with the purpose of selling you something. Uh, but that's the thing, you know, it's just these companies are just so focused on selling and selling and selling. And I get it. I mean, I get it. It's just I, for well, me, it's irritating. No, doesn't this I mean, because I'm I'm right there with you. Like I yeah. I've never done a sponsored post on my Instagram. Like, yeah, I actually know what my ad metrics should be if someone were to appro approach me for that. Um, you know, and I know how much I should charge. It's a, uh, I feel the next phase of social interactions on the internet will have to come from a company who doesn't crowbar in monetization after the fact. Mm -hmm. So many of these things that we're using today, starting from the friendsters and the classmates.com has been, let's build a cheap free service. Let's see how we can make it cool. 
And then once we reach some sort of tipping point, then we're going to cram in a bunch of monetization schemes, the, the worst of which usually is how can we traffic user data? Yeah. Um, but on top of that, just like how do we force more ads into your timeline? How do we yeah. rearrange your timeline so that you're not seeing information that's uh, topical or relevant to the time that it was published? Um, in, in, instead, what I, what I think we'll see for the next phase, Internet 4.0, will be how do we engage in a profitable endeavor, a service that can generate income and be clear about that intention from the very beginning so that consumers know what they're getting into. And know okay, I'll give you an example, Amazon. I mean, I know Amazon is a shopping mall mm -hmm. and I will visit Amazon whenever I want to visit Amazon because I need to buy something, but I'm not forced to deal with it unless I follow them. Uh, for some people, the, then, and I know that Amazon can be smart. Let's come up with the deal of the day or the deal of everything. And, and you know, now you follow Amazon by choice, but you're not being spoon fed more Amazon. And I'm not saying they don't do this because they do. Uh, but we're not being spoon fed this by the people that I follow because they're getting money for it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple of uh, our people on the YouTube chat um, say, yeah, they agree. I hate how we've turned ourselves into brands and how f we feel we lack value if yeah. we don't have that. So uh, there's that. And Which the, has also been a major, a, major part of the, a major part of the conversation in this, these Facebook hearings is Zuckerberg literally saying, like, it's a free service, and they signed the licensing agreement when they agreed to... Have you ever met a human that's service? ever read... I mean, see, here's a motion for the next law. Dear companies, can we please get a quick and simple basic? This is what you're signing. Uh, nobody's going to read that user agreement. That's the first thing that needs to change in the in, in, in the countries. It's like, shoot. I, I the GDPR. Like, are you kidding me? Nobody reads that. I, and I, so, I find, I, I love gonna, it. I, give me a second. And I love it how Windows <laughs> does it. I love it how Windows does it. Like whenever you're activating your Windows computer and you get the EULA, the end user license agreement, and they're like, you can choose to opt out, but then no Windows. Oh, you yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, you can totally make that choice. The choice is up to you. And you then, decided as a as a, a, a knowledgeable consumer what was right for you. I'm actually gonna um, I'm gonna screen share this here real quick, and uh, I, I'm trying to keep the the YouTube page public so that you can see it. This is a uh, term. Um, I don't know if this vibe. is actually, yeah, yeah. If this is actually broadcasting correctly. So, oh my god, what is this? I don't know. It's uh, it looks to be. Um, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Juan's uh, audio is cut out on the YouTube feed. Could be. Could uh, be. Can you hear anything from him? No, I can't. Juan, you there? I mean, he could be, but uh, yeah, I'll just you know. Hopefully, he keeps on talking so that Thanks. we can, I can cut him. Some... There we go. Juan, we lost you for a bit. And yeah, no. He's talking. Yeah. He just doesn't know we can't hear him. So I think I think yeah he I, I think he should uh, if he I'm can cut off that, the my uh, my uh, no it's not that it's anytime I screen share and I'm not also clicked on Hangouts then Hangouts locks up so that's not a, a, a YouTube issue that's a Hangouts issue so I don't, I don't know if you copied <laughs> this but... one they okay. one the same <laughs> okay so what is this you're showing us. So, so in 2016, the Norwegian Consumer uh, Council did a live word by word nonstop reading of all of Apple's uh, and third party end user licensing agreements on the average iPhone. And it took them 32 hours to complete the live reading of what an end user licensing agreement resembles when you buy a new iPhone. Oh, did my they God. have to switch in people for this. Of course they did. Or I, I don't I don't know like you know again uh, the, the what they were showing here is sort of like you know a, a compressed uh, uh, cutting cutty version of that but they're they're actually trying to read it and that that stack of paper next to her is the printout of what you're what? agreeing to when you're when you're signing up for and this is this is for the iPhone this is actually a company that we hold up as as being pretty good 
about privacy. Oh, oh my about God. their consumer protection. See, see, that needs to change. I understand the whole purpose of, of being like, you know, I used to write user manuals for a company. And at some point, you needed to make sure that everything that you wrote covered absolutely all the possibilities. I get that. Uh, but really, like, I don't think any of my, any of the manuals that I ever built, I, I, I wrote uh shoot i wrote seven manuals i don't think any of the manuals that i ever wrote for to be used on an airplane are as thick as what you need to read to use an iphone mm-hmm mm -hmm. <sighs> and so and also to, to what benefit if you wrote a manual and you had important information that yeah. a consumer or a contractor needed to know would you expect them to chew through 32 hours of reading to get the information that they would need to complete. And so obviously well, this there is every a benefit liability to that having a day and a half's worth of reading material in this without agreement. any breaks, without any breaks, knowing that no one can get through it all. No. No. That is incorrect. It is to me that is incorrect. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> no, yeah, just prevent all the class action lawsuits from happening uh, in the first place. Uh, I, 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 it's funny. I was only here for an hour, but I, I'm loving this conversation. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to move on to the next one? Uh, we can end it on that one if you want. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think I that was a pretty good stopping point because yeah. like, uh, or actually, no, here, let me let me throw this one out here real quick, too. Uh, did you guys actually watch the uh, the John Legend? Um, oh, uh, can video? I? Can I be omitted from my opinion on this? No. Why, no, 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 Why is that? Come on. Oh, man. I love contradictory beings. Uh, guys, have you watched that video? I, well, that's that's why I asked. Is 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 Are you against the story? Are you against the story of this thing? I, I'm sorry. I've been filming so many. I mean, Juan, you're a camera expert. I've been reviewing pretty much every phone, and I love the Pixel to death. Don't get me wrong. It's just I don't know how a video like that is possible without manual controls. I I okay. So here's the thing. We're not impressed by the pixel. The pixel is irrelevant to what made this music video look cool. You know, it, it's the same problem I had when that, um, I, and I forget who did it, but uh, a tech outlet compared the LG V30 and its log capture high quality 4K video files against a red camera. And wow, look amazing at how great this phone does in competing against the cinematic camera. And then we saw a whole bunch of gimbal tracking and drone shots. Mm -hmm. So you're not impressed by the V30. No. The V30 is irrelevant to the conversation. You're impressed by the fact that you got this amazing aerial drone photography. The camera is, is completely secondary to the conversation of the thousands of dollars of platform that yeah. went into supporting that camera. So I totally believe that you could, using the stock camera app, although though I doubt they did, they probably used something like Cinema 4K. That, that's the um, thing. It's just, I, I don't think it's possible. I mean, first of all, for those of you that have used, uh, because here's the thing, if that video was, was shot in daylight, I would have been like, yes, all right, fine, fine. I, I could believe that. But when you shoot on a smartphone camera sensor, I like one phone that does an amazing job, and I, I say it, is the iPhone either the iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, or the iPhone 10. I feel like people don't know that there are clips in my Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus review that were filmed on an iPhone 10, 4K at 60. I am incredibly impressed with what that camera can do, but here, here's the thing. All those clips, whatever, I, I used like six or seven clips within that video. Uh, they were filmed during the day. You can't get that level of quality at night. The sensor is just too small. The lens is just too small to be able to provide good quality video without the, the constant jitter that it does trying to autofocus because there are no well, manual controls. Well, th this this is this is why I, I'm here. Let me try and screen share again and see if my computer locks up. Oh, man, but, you're gonna um, but, <laughs> Don't but share when, the video. When, when you go into this, it's not showing the video, Jules. It's as soon as I click off of the window in Hangouts, it locks up. No, no, no. I mean, don't show the video because we're going to get copyright. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I've, 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 I've paused it and I've got all the audio cut off and everything in too. But the reason why I paused on this frame here is because you can see the overall blue light tone. Yeah. But then when we scroll down and we actually see the conditions that they were shooting in, they had that entire set washed in the same kind of light 
But look at the actual phone screen that they've got. That doesn't look. That's not. To that's me. not. No, that's not the viewfinder. That's not of the, native the, app. the Pixel camera app, right? So no, again, look at the rig that they put the Pixel on. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about the stutter that you get in low-light environments, which is true with a lot of software processing and the the software image stabilization, which works with the hardware image stabilization, you would get that little low-light yeah. shift yeah. Um, as, as they're trying to blend frames together. But you're not going to see that when you're on rigs like this. And then, and then uh, with, uh, with and braces, then, with a tri huge 50 pound tripod with and, a brace on top of a brace on top of but, a brace. But fine, I'll give him that. I've, you know, there are vlogs that I've done with a with a with a gimbal. That's I'll give him that. It's just uh, <laughs> like I mean, the 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 oh, cradle oh, that that oh, phone is in oh, is probably oh, twice the cost of any gimbal that you use. I'm used, sure. I'm sure. Let alone, I'm, I'm sure. The, but what I'm tracking, saying, panning, and uh, slider mechanism that they were on right I, and i get that what i'm saying is fine it's a music video there's there's high production they i mean they won't use an expensive red camera manually i mean they are they're also mounted in a very expensive tripod and things like that so i'll give them that the problem is i is is the camera really capable of capturing low light like this because you know what the camera will start doing the camera in mat in auto controls will stop dropping shutter speed yeah. with that with that uh you know and so if you look i don't see any like flashing of the lights i don't see any of the typical things that a smartphone will do once it starts going into grain well hell. but that's that's just it is is like i i you know again i i wholly believe that they used the pixel hardware for for shooting this music video because they're not really in low light they're 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 i mean look at when you look at that photo of what they were using on that set that set is washed there is a ton it. of blue light for the for the camera sensor to utilize to, to your point and then we also have to wholly believe that there is a monster amount of back-end post-processing video mm -hmm. editing color correction and everything else to try and get that to try and get this looking consistent and uniform even with them shooting under manual controls so so literally what we have here is the pixel camera sensor was used to shoot a music video the pixel camera sensor in hundreds of thousands of dollars of stabilization and movement hardware and then hundreds of thousands of dollars of lighting and grip and electrical and then hundreds of thousands of dollars in post-production was able to shoot a pretty decent looking music video yeah <laughs> and i'm sure and i'm sure they had to adapt some sort of a lens i mean I, and again, I don't I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, when I look at that rig, it looks like they might have just been using for a lot of these shots. It looks like they could have just been using the pixels standard glass. It's just one but. picture from Google's the keyword blog. And they have a whole bunch of of, uh, you know, just fluffy text to promote the pixel with like uh, with a uh, freaking John Legend saying, I love using pixel. Like they're pulling an iPhone there. I love using Pixel to talk to Chrissy and Luna while I'm on the road. Like that's this is all what it's about. Like this is this is the part. This is not Billboard. This is not for Bill. This is for Google. They're like this is the, there's there had to be some sort of cross section between John Legend's agents and whoever else or the label and Google saying let's let's come together and uh, make sure that people know about Google and not about iPhone. That's my opinion. Oh well, <laughs> but that's, but all, that's all it takes. We got a tweet um, from Renato Laporte, which again, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, you know, the the world's first full smartphone movie. It's talking about someone shooting a movie on a smartphone, and then he he's got a photo, which again, we're talking about a, a, multiple thousands of dollars on a cinema quality lens in an enclosure, which probably cost a couple thousand dollars for the rails and connectors and the and the the, yeah. the the box that goes in front of the lens to um, act as a as a light filter and and all of this kit which goes into it. And you're like, we've gotten to a point, the camera is kind of irrelevant. You know, it, it, you didn't shoot a movie on a smartphone. You shot a movie on cinema grade gear. It's on... like the red, it's like the red smartphone that's coming. It's modular. <laughs> and once you snap everything you can snap on that thing, it'll be great. But, yeah. 
you know, but, I, but you, know, you weren't walking around like, oh man, this shot's so amazing. Oh, yeah. look, I've, I've, I'm shooting a movie. This is going to be in theaters. Wow. Look yeah. at this. Like that's, that's not what's happening yeah. here. And, and, and it, it's such an obvious play to me. Like why I get cranky about it is because like you, you're, you're making people feel emotionally good about buying a pixel. Look, they shot this amazing music video on the phone that I have in my pocket. Isn't that amazing? In your Which, pocket now? What? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good pun. Well done. Um, but but that's that's irrelevant to the conversation of shooting a cinema piece of of material. When yeah. when when you make a movie, you're using movie grade um components to get that movie done and you're using the tremendous amount of education and experience from the people who are designing the lighting from the people who are doing the sound from the people who are doing the choreography from uh, the cinematographer everyone every piece of that chain has decades of experience yeah. to also work around the compromises of yeah. using a phone as exactly. the final capture medium or the final capture source. You know what a good example of this? Mike Castellucci from WFF, WFAA in Dallas. He had a whole bunch of uh, just like he's produced a series of reports, feature reports, or or even breaking news just on from his iPhone. And that this was back in 2013 when the iPhone was starting to get into that great category, that that yeah. hot category. So yeah, and this and this is a guy who's adapted to many changes in the industry. He's a veteran in this, so being able to adapt to that is just one of the ways that uh, like the whole media industry has to you know just follow on and make sure that they are able to take the money that's coming in and also take the technology. True. True true All right. um so anyway I, I just like that's the last little buyer beware i wanted to throw in there your, your <laughs> smartphone camera is really good and you can do some amazing things don't with get it. me wrong we love our pixels we <laughs> love our pixels there's nothing wrong with the phone it's just not a red camera <laughs> right and it's not a cinema camera and that's also oh, oh, oh my god I, I can even give you examples of using an a6300 and and or the the panasonic g85 which i've been using lately uh, mm -hmm. and, you, and you just, you know, unless you invest on some amazing thousand dollar lens, don't expect much from it. <laughs> if you use Again, the camera and, as it came from kit and don't and even expect then, much from it, you know, like even then it's like, well, do you have soft boxes? Do you have lighting? Do you have flashes? What, exactly. what kind of what kind of tripod head are you? <laughs> yeah. Using? What kind of specific result are you looking for that makes it look perfect? 100% perfect to your eye at the moment that you need it. It's like, sure, like you can get all that well, stuff. I, I, I can, I can, I can dump a Hasselblad in a novice's hands, and their photos will probably still look about the same as the photos from their phone. That, that, that has always been a truism. It's just we're now starting to see the flip of that, you know, where the consumer grade technology has gotten really good. You when it comes to, when it comes with. to, when it comes to photography, I have to agree. When it comes to video, there is still more to do. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I see what you're saying there. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's, that's, that's when, that's, when it, when it comes to photography, I, you know, I, I went to the Vatican, I had a G6 in my hand, which was a prototype and I had an A6300 with a, with a good 35 millimeter meter 1.8. 1, 1. And there came a point where I was like, you know what, I'll just keep using the G6. I, you know, I, there were even photos where I found that HDR, which was only available on the G6 would capture better dynamic range in certain shots than I could with the A6300. So I ended up choosing the phone just because, not because the phone could do a better job than the camera when it came to hardware, but because the software enabled things that even the camera couldn't do, like HDR. Right. You know? Well, and we're definitely seeing the software processing argument being made pretty heavily by a lot of uh, companies out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's as good a place to stop as any, man. I'm I'm glad you were able no, let's to keep going. Yeah, uh, for the conversation. Uh, let's just keep going. Hold on. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um <laughs> yeah, definitely. So so folks, uh, again, I want to thank all the people that were uh, joining the conversation and uh, especially in the live chat on the uh, the live video feed and uh, those of you using the PN weekly hashtag. We are collecting some stuff for a, a viewer mailbag episode. So keep sending us those emails too. So folks, another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter where Jules is at Point Jules. Jaime is 
at Jaime underscore Rivera, and I am humbly at some gadget guy. And Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube, our home site, pocketnow.com, and Spanish speakers. Please check out es.pocketnow.com. Uh, shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile tech, dropping reviews anywhere you can review a podcast, help get more eyes and ears on this show every week. Uh, because ultimately, there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in. What?